Good morning, and welcome to this celebration of the Liturgy of the Word for the 26th Sunday in Ordinary Time. I'm Monsignor Michael Champ, pastor of the Old Catholic Church of Antioch in Tucson. So glad to have you with us today. Let us begin with our entrance antiphon from Daniel chapter 3. O Lord, you had just cause to judge men as you did, because we sinned against you and disobeyed your will. But now you show us your greatness of heart, and treat us with your unbounded kindness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us begin, as we always do, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray today for the peace of the kingdom which we have been promised. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in your wonderful, unbounded mercy, you have revealed the beauty of your power through your constant forgiveness of sin. May your power of this love be in our hearts to bring your pardon and your kingdom to all that we meet. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading today is from the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 18. Among the first group of Hebrews that departed for Babylon, there was a priest called Ezekiel. As a wandering preacher, he went from one Jewish settlement to the other, encouraging his people to have faith in God, but also correcting them when he found them guilty. Listen now to this reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord, You say the Lord's way is not fair. Hear now, house of Israel, it is my way that is unfair, or rather, are not your ways unfair? When someone virtuous turns away from virtue to commit iniquity and dies, it is because of the iniquity he committed that he must die. But if he turns from the wickedness he has committed and does what is right and just, he shall then preserve his life. Since he has turned away from all the sins he committed, he shall surely live and not die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our response today is Psalm 25. Join with me. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Remember that your compassion, O Lord, and your love are from of old. The sins of my youth and my frailties remember not. In your kindness remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, thus he shows sinners the way. He guides the humble to justice, he teaches the humble his way. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Our second reading today is from the book of Philemon. Notice that Paul writes from his imprisonment in Christ's cause that we read in verse 12. He writes about dissension and evil that besets many congregations. Listen now to St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any solace in love, any participation in the Spirit, any compassion and mercy, complete my joy by being one of the same mind with the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. Do nothing out of selfishness or out of vain glory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, each looking out not for his own interests, but also for those of others. Have in you the same attitude that is also in Christ Jesus. For it is written, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Coming in human likeness, amid and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every other name, 
that at the name Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join me now as we prepare for the reading of the gospel. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Please. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. My sheep hear my voice, says the Lord. I know them, and they follow me. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, What is your opinion? A man had two sons. He first came to the first and said, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son said in reply, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind and went. The man came to the other son and gave the same order, and when he said, Yes, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did his, father, did his father's will? Well, they answered, the second, or the first son. Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. When John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him. But tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet even when you saw that, you did not later change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I say unto you, prostitutes and tax collectors will be entering the kingdom before you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord here is giving a parable about responsibility. Particularly, obedience of one son to do his father's will, whereas the other one, who said, no, I wouldn't do the father's will, in fact repented of his negative response and did the father's will. Whereas the first one that agreed to do it went away and did not. Perhaps he thought someone else would do the work. We put great stock in each other relative to our word or our promise to live up to those things that we are obligated to do, either by choice of our own or by virtue of the fact of our responsibility based upon our position in the world. But if we do not live up to that responsibility, then our opinion in the eyes of others uh, the opinion of us, rather, in the eyes of others, will be diminished, and rightly so. For if one cannot be trusted, then in fact it's very difficult to deal with such a person. One has to be given a, a, a slight, if you will. Uh, you must deal with everything that someone says with a grain of salt, so, so the saying goes. You must not, in fact, put your stock in that particular promise. That particular person's word is of no value. Well, this is something that we certainly do not want to cultivate in our lives. We want to cultivate our lives around the fact that we are honest, straightforward people, and that we do what we say we're going to do. Now, in the case of this particular parable, when the first son refused to do what his father said, he was, in fact, obeying a direct order. Well, depending upon his responsibility to the father, if he lives at home, for example, or if, in fact, he was a regular employee of the father, to not follow the orders given to one by a superior, just out of determination not to do it, is wrong in the essence. A sin, if you will, in our parlance today. But later on, he saw the errors of his ways, and he wanted to live up to that responsibility that he had, and he went into the vineyard and worked as he was told to do. So thus, he repented and came back into his father's good graces. This is akin to those who hear the word of the Lord, maybe at first, and shun it. They do not respond to the salvation message, the gift that is given to us freely by God. But later, after consideration, do repent of our sins and do accept the word of the Lord. 
and those people are accepted into the fold. We heard in last week's sermon that God is so generous that he will accept us at any time that we come to him. So that's why deathbed confessions and dying declarations of fealty to our blessed Lord is something of great importance. Because those people, if in fact they are sincere, will be taken into the kingdom. This is a promise that God has made us. People are not necessarily quite so generous with one another. Once spurned, most likely, that individual will not be dealt with again. We tend to put people on a back burner. We tend to put them off. We, we do not welcome them back. If we do, we welcome them back on the condition that if you break your promise again, I will have nothing more to do with you. Well, this is not the way God is. We're told by Jesus in our parables that, in fact, God will welcome us whenever we come and ask for forgiveness. But our society today doesn't spend a whole lot of effort, it seems, on making people responsible for their own decisions. We see this in the wanton uh, looting and rioting that's going on in our streets in some cities today. These individuals have decided they don't need to live up to the law, and they justify their actions based upon some perceived injustice that happened to someone else, someone that they're not directly related with. They, in fact, are taking upon themselves the burden they believe of proving that the system is wrong, and they do this by riotous acts, in short, acts of terrorism. Martin Luther King once said that the protester ceases to become a protester the first time he picks up a brick and throws it through a window. Then he becomes a terrorist. And this is someone who fought hard and long for his people's right to be free, right to exercise their right to vote, their right for free employment, and things of this nature in the 60s particularly, before the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. And so he's held up as a model of behavior, yet when we see these same people doing riotous acts, acts of terrorism, we wonder if they've ever heard of Martin Luther King or ever knew anything of his particular principles. But it starts much earlier than that. It starts in the home. When we teach our children to be responsible, to obey by virtue of the fact that it's the right thing to do, not out of fear of punishment, then we cultivate in them the acceptable parameters of behavior that will serve them throughout their lives. We teach them to be righteous, in effect. And in fact, then, when they are faced with decisions in their lives, without our guidance, we trust that that example, that training, will bring them to the decision to be a righteous individual. Something that we all claim to be. All good Christians claim to be righteous individuals. But if our words are only that, only words, and we go out into the world and we are wanton with our behavior, we disregard things as simple as traffic laws. Uh, we give short shrift to the rights of others. We push ahead when someone else, in fact, might be in line. Or we do not give of the opportunity for someone else to take their turn when it's rightfully theirs. When we pass by those people that we could have helped when they are in need, when it would in fact not really have been difficult for us to do so, simply because of the fact that we're too busy. We don't have the time, we don't have the interest, it may not be convenient. Those are the kinds of things that we as responsible Christians are expected to do, to take our brother's burden upon ourselves, and in so doing, emulate the behavior of Jesus Christ our Lord. God love you, and may you all be responsible citizens. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We move on today, and we see ourselves as the perfect gift to give to God. God of mercy, accept ourselves as an offering, and make us a source of blessing for you, as our God and our Savior, and for us, that it reflects well upon us. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. In Psalm 119, we read, O Lord, remember the words you spoke to me, your servant, which made me live in hope and consoled me when I was downcast. Well, bow your heads now and pray for God's mercy. O holy God, 
We come to you today humbled when we consider the great lessons that Jesus has taught us. We see ourselves as unworthy for the gift of salvation, but you have taught us that through our faith and our actions, thereby our good deeds showing that we have faith, we will be made more worthy for that holy gift. Although we're not deserving, we nonetheless strive to accede to your gift. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our liturgy of the word for today has ended. Let us go forth from this time and place and serve the Lord and one another. Thanks be to God. God love you and thank you for being with us today. Goodbye.